Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Olivia Hereford with the Bay ICT Partnership for our February Tech Talk. And I want to first of all apologize. We had a real big snafu. We had the wrong link in all of our promotion, but we're getting the word out and uh, We'll look forward for look forward for people to getting the word and 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 joining us today because we're really excited about this Black History Month uh, tech talk. Uh, I have with us uh, this evening Babette Jackson and Hakeem Asini, and we're going to talk about the power of character on the tech talk journey. So here's what we're going to um, do this evening. We're going to start with some introductions. And then we're going to have a panel discussion, some questions for Babette and Hakeem. And um, then afterwards, we'll uh, take some questions and they'll answer, th answer them. So I encourage you uh, as uh, our speakers are sharing uh, with us this evening that you, if you have any questions, put them in chat. Uh, I have uh, helping me this in facilitation uh, this evening, Sarah Ferguson from our team, and she's going to be watching the chat and welcoming people in as they join join the call. So again, also when we get to the point where we do Q and A, uh, we'll I'll uh, stop sharing my screen so that we can see everybody who's joined us. And I highly encourage you to uh, at that point turn on your cameras or use an avatar so that when if you have a question, we can see. Uh, Babette and, and Hakeem can see who's talking to them. So anyway, all right, so let's get started with the introductions. Um, I'm gonna do these quick introductions and then I'm gonna hand it off to Babette and Hakeem. They maybe wanna add a little bit about what these roles mean, but Babette Jackson is a tier three SLC analyst. She's also an insider threat hunting and data loss prevention engineer at Juniper. And Hakeem Asini, is a senior product manager for detection and response at Salesforce. So Babette, would you like to tell folk a little bit more about um, your, your role? And um, let me add a pin to Babette. There she is. Want to get you right up front there <laughs> so everybody can see you. Um, you want to tell folk a little bit more about your role? Just a little, you know. Yeah, um, so in simple terms, my role for data loss prevention is to protect the company's most valuable Weil das ein wichtiges Event passt ganz viel so Spezialisten professionelle in dem Bereich. Everybody please mute. Thank you. Um, yeah, going back, uh, my main role is to pretty much for data loss prevention to protect the company's most valuable assets from leaving the company uh, for insider from insider threats and insider threat hunting. I just recently got my promotion. So right now I am in training to uh, threat hunt, which basically means to go out there and search on the networks and search on the computers for threats that the tools that we have do not find. So overall, that's my role. And Hakeem? Um, I think Babette and I are in the same universe. So uh, my my job as a product manager is to help manage the products um, and the tool sets um, that are used in detection and response um, and to work with clients um, uh, as a, uh, you know, onboard programs and to answer any questions and provide support to clients as well. Great, thank you. So again, both of both of you again are in cybersecurity, and I think that's we have quite a few of our cybersecurity students on the call. So this will be very informative for them. Okay, all right, let's get started. Um, you know, given that uh, we're recognizing Black History, um, what person or moment in your history influenced your journey to who you are and what you do today? And Babette, we're gonna we're gonna start with start with you. Yes, right on time. <laughs> um, so the person who influenced me the most, I will admit her name is escaping me, but she was a part of the Little Rock Nine. Um, she was the first person to integrate 
um, the schools. And the reason why this story influenced me is because it was one of the first books that I can remember reading in elementary and her story, uh, which the book is called Warriors Don't Cry. It gave me a lot of inspiration to keep pushing forward um, no matter the disparities that came towards me. Uh, and I found many places within my life where I felt like uh, I was a part of the Little Nine, uh, Little, yeah, the Little Rock Nine crew um, due to the fact that I was going to private schools where I was the minority. Uh, in sixth grade, I was uh, one of six Black people in a school from K to eighth grade. And then as uh, my journey continued, I found myself continuing to be the minority. And as we all know, being a minority in a place where people don't look like you, it can be relatively hard. But reading this story, it gave me strength. And every time that I did have a down moment, I always look back to the story and believe that she made a whole revolution out of it. And it gave me a reason to keep going. Yeah, if a, if a little girl <laughs> can 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 deal with that, I mean, why can't we, right? What about you, Hakeem? So I, I don't know if I can actually zero in on a person or a moment, but what I'll say is when I think about Black history, I really take time to pause and think about the shoulders, the hard work of the people who came before us and how I'm standing on their shoulders, right? So when I think about what my parents had to go through in the 50s and 60s, um, when they went to universities and were trying to pave the way, um, I know I face challenges, everyone faces challenges, BIPOC people, LGBT plus people, um, but it's much easier and it's at a different, a lower temperature than it was back then. So I, I really take a moment to, to pause and understand that I'm privileged to be here today and taking advantage of all the programs and the opportunities that are here that weren't here for our parents. The fact that we can have these courageous conversations um, between ourselves and our peers. Um, so, so, and, and then I remember, I, I really remember, and I, I wanna acknowledge the pain and the suffering that they had to endure to make sure that my life is easy today. And I hope that I can carry that forward by making it even easier for the people who are coming up behind me. Indeed, yeah. I, I love the I love I love reading the the because we because of them we can articles that I get in my email. They're wonderful. All right, let's start about talking about your uh, education journey and experience. And so here's that here's that photo, Hakeem. I was telling you about that you can get a laugh about. Yeah. That you? That you? Wow. <laughs> you, you, can, you can tell I was a big fan of Angela Davis at the time. <laughs> anyway, tell us about your education journey and experience. Where did it begin and how did it turn toward technology? That it? Um, education, again, began, I jumped around from different schools, went to one of the worst public schools in San Francisco to one of the best private schools in San Francisco. Um, full disclosure, I was not into technology like most people were in college for my classes. Um, I wasn't good at math. I wasn't good at science. I, I didn't understand why my counselor wanted me to take this chance. Uh, most of the classes that I did have to retake in high school uh, were science and math. So when my counselor gave me this idea of STEM, 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 I was like, are you crazy? That doesn't make any sense. But he said, um, you have a lot of potential and I know that you can do it. And given that you are a minority, you can use that to your advantage. So I was like, okay, whatever. Uh, I took the chance. I got into Cal Poly Pomona, uh, but I got in for computer science. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing when I got in for computer science. I didn't know the full story of what it was. But one year in, actually going to my counselor, I looked at the um, at the course list and I had the conversation of how long is it going to take me to graduate, um, given that I started college in a whole year of remedial math. And he told me starting college with a whole year of remedial, remedial math and getting a 
degree in computer science would take me at least seven to eight years to graduate given the full coursework. So <laughs> with all of that given, I told him, I don't think I want to do this, but I still love computers. Um, and giving my classes, it wasn't a lot of people in there who like talked and I'm an introvert, but I do like to talk. So I told him that, is there an intersection between people who like know how to talk, but get, still have the opportunity to work with computers. And he gave me the degree or major of computer information systems. But the special thing about this program is that it was mixed with business administration. So what my school did was a wonderful thing. They integrated a space where the business people can talk to the technology people and the technology people can talk to the business people. Um, so once I got into my core classes, uh, I kind of fell in love with the idea. I felt like um, Penelope off of Criminal Minds, uh, which was one of my favorite shows in elementary school while I was watching elementary, uh, while I was watching Criminal Minds in elementary school, who knows, but it was my favorite show. And in doing so, I always wanted to be like Penelope with like five computers in a dark room, just like typing away and um, like not really working side by side with anyone, but you know, uh, doing all the work behind the scenes, but being like the whole, holding everything on my back. So that was my inspiration to do it. Um, and then as the further along I got into my coursework, cybersecurity, uh, as we all know, cybersecurity is a place where you can't really know everything. And every day I feel like something changes. <laughs> so it's forever learning. And one of my favorite quotes is to never stop learning because life never stops teaching. And cybersecurity literally encompassed this. And this is why I fell in love with the idea because you, you can't know it all. <laughs> and it's an everyday learning experience. Okay. So yeah, and I I went to the State University of New York at Buffalo. Go Buffalo, go Bills. Um, and I was an English major. So uh, the last year of of I was also the editor in chief of the Spectrum, which was our college newspaper. And uh, before the academic year kicked off, we got a new computing system, and it was all networked, and and we tried to digitize everything. And that's sort of where it started. Then I moved to San Francisco and I was working for a couple of local papers, a Bay Area reporter, uh, like a traditional journalist, it was a pen and paper. And um, I got an internship doing something for Lexis Nexus. And then I got my first job at AOL, right? Writing for an AOL property and just doing little articles to put them on the original AOL. I'm dating myself and this is when you had dial up modems. And if you don't know what a dial up modem is, that's okay, All right? <laughs> You have mail, right? So, um, but then I had to start putting these articles with pictures and links to chat rooms and links to other things using the AOL proprietary language, which was called Rain Man. And that's sort of where I got into coding, right? So it's like, I wanna do this article, I wanna make it interactive. You need to do this coding. Then we sort of took it off AOL to, uh, it was a Time Warner, uh, sort of uh, property to Pathfinder. That was our first big website. This is the days of Netscape. So we had to start learning HTML and browser interaction. And that was how I sort of fell in love with computers and technology and uh, new media, Web.0. I then went to Carnegie Mellon. I did an MBA with a technology focus. And I ended up working at Credit Suisse um, in the technology department, working on getting the Palm Pilot to do online trades because Palm Pilots were super hot then. If you don't know what a Palm Pilot is, I'm dating myself, but <laughs> you can Google it, right? So, and that was really exciting. Like that was bleeding edge technology back then. So I worked on that. And then I ended up going to Citigroup for five years working in their wealth department in the technology field. Um, and that was still sort of technology. And I didn't really get into cybersecurity until um, I ended up, yeah, I've always wanted to learn, right? So just like Babette, I was like, you always have to learn new tool sets. If your tool set is out of date, like what new skill or certification do you want to get? So um, I was working for Barclays in South Africa. I came back to America. I missed the whole app and cloud thing. And I heard about this uh, nonprofit called JVS. We're doing a Salesforce administrator training program. And I took that and I took a PMP. 
And then I got this job doing a Salesforce project at Wells Fargo. Um, and that was the first cybersecurity sort of like main project that I had to do. And then I was off to the races, just like Babette said, like there's always something new every single day, every single week. Um, and it just keeps you on your toes. So everything you read about in the paper, like you're literally solving those problems at work the next day. <laughs> Constant lifelong learning. And I don't think that's just restricted to cybersecurity either. Um, often for us uh, starting in college, uh, post-secondary, and sometimes before then, is when we begin to get that feeling of not belonging. Um, and um, I call that othering. Um, what are some examples of your othering experiences and, and what kept you motivated to persist toward your goals, even when you were feeling like maybe you didn't belong or why did I do this? <laughs> so that, that let's start with you. Um, my othering, Feeling began in sixth grade, then like carried through high school, but it really started in college when I got to my core classes. Um, once I got to my core classes, um, the friends that I did make, I started asking them like, hey, you want to do homework together? Are you taking these classes? Are you taking this math? And once I got to a certain point, none of my friends were taking that type of those type of classes. And then once I got to the core classes, I began to become the only female. I began to become the only Black person. I began to come, become the only Black female in the class. Uh, and then on top of that, a lot of the students already had some type of interest or some type of passion or some type of lineage of technology in their family line, as in their family owned some type of technology business or their parents were engineers. Um, one incident that I remember is walking into class, into the class classroom and my teacher asking me, are your parents computer engineers too? And I was like, no, my dad was a carpenter and my mom is, uh, she doesn't have a job right now. And just hearing that, it kind of opened up my eyes and seeing that I'm in a whole different world in a whole different space. And I do admit there was many times that I broke down because I felt like I wasn't like as smart as the other kids, given the fact that I had to work 10 times harder and it took a long time for me to process stuff while I was in class. Uh, so when I did go to class, I was scared to ask questions because I felt like everybody around me immediately got it. But once I started to understand that I couldn't do it by myself and I started to actually try to make friends inside of that classroom, I understood that nobody really understood any of that stuff. Everyone, if you could please mute. Thank you. Um, but point being, the thing that motivated me is that I knew that I didn't want to be the last one to be the only Black person in those classes. I knew that I had to find something that was bigger than me uh, in doing so, because if I could find something that was bigger than me, as in find inspiration and motivation outside of me, I knew that I can continue. So what I wanted to do was to inspire and motivate. So I continued my path um, because I know if I made it through, then people will come to me and look at me and understand that if she did it, then I can do it too. And I wanted to provide every resource that I possibly could to those students, to those people in those positions, because I didn't want people to feel like how I felt in college. I felt alone. I didn't really have anyone to look up to. I didn't really have anyone to uh, ask questions to because I, no one looked like me. So I just knew I had to make it because I needed more people out there who looked like me. And that's the thing that kept me going. Wow. So all of your motivation came from within. You didn't have a mentor. You didn't have family that you could go to. It was just, just the, the, the passion around saying, okay, I don't want other people to have to go through this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Hakeem, <laughs> what was your experience? You know, that was really interesting. So, so 
you know, my, my parents taught me, and they told me at a very young age, you have to be twice as bright and twice as good. Um, that's just the world you live in. So, um, you know, when I, when I started my professional career and I noticed that I was, you know, one of two out of 500 African-Americans, I made sure I, it, it was hard, right? So I, I came up with a coping mechanism. The coping mechanism was either find yourself in a personal board of directors or some personal allies who you can go to to ask questions of how to navigate the politics in the room. And when you're feeling down or insecure, how do you come, how do you still remain confident and articulate in, in tough situations and when you're having arguments. <clears throat> and I was blessed to find some very powerful um, African-American women who had been in the financial technology game for a long time, who literally guided me when I was upset, calmed me down, who taught me how to deal with these situations. I also had a lot of allies, right? So people who didn't look like me, older white men, um, Asian people, people of Indian descent, who were also on my sort of internal board of directors so that when I, I had these feelings, I could talk to them and figure out how to adjust. But most importantly, I think is leveraging, and this is you know the, the corporate sort of employee resource groups, right? So even uh, in, when I did my MBA, there was six out of six African-American people out of like 250, right? And I was like, form your group, have your, your meetings and your events, create the safe space to have those courageous conversations and to vent and to adjust and to hear from each other um, and, and, and give yourself a mission, right? So the mission right now I have is to bring more uh, BIPOC people of color and um, underrepresented minorities and people who come from disadvantaged backgrounds into the field of cybersecurity because I truly believe like it's it's a growing field and there's a shortage so that's my passion so together the six of us we formed like the Black Business Association we had events we networked with other um, people and we pulled people into our universe to say this is our mission so um, that other experience can be challenging, but I think, you know, try to turn it into something positive, right? Find, it can be a weakness or a strength. And since you have no other option, but to move forward and to deal and to excel, you have to turn that into a strength. So find your allies, find a mission and just keep on rocking it because, you know, you do have to be twice as good. You do have to be twice as smart, but you know, you will, but you also have to hold your head up high, right? So um, those are the three things I sort of always kept in mind when I was going to work, but when I left work, you have your good days and your bad days as well. We're all human. That's true. I like that idea of having your personal board of directors. Love mm -hmm. it. <laughs> having those allies and, you know, affinity groups at mm -hmm. your college, where you work, they're great support, really excellent support. All right, so now that you're in tech, can you share with us, you know, how you landed your first job in tech and, and uh, what, what, what do you believe set you apart in getting that first role? Yeah, bet. Oh, well, I have an interesting story. <laughs> um, so as college was ending, all my friends and everybody else were getting their dream jobs and I was applying for jobs. I didn't know, just throwing out applications, didn't really know what I was shooting for. Um, and then just out of luck, I get this message from my now manager saying, can you explain a little bit more about your resume? Um, this was for Juniper Networks where I'm at now. And in my heart, I was like, oh, you like my resume? Great. Um, but pushing down further down the line, he said my resume was like terrible and he didn't know what I wanted to do because it was all over the place. And I was just shooting for the stars. Um, the point being, I 
applied to be a digital forensics analyst because I took my computer forensics class in college and just absolutely fell in love with it. I got an A, it was supposed to be a really hard class and I gave it my all and I got like a perfect grade in the class. So I said I wanted to become a digital forensics analyst. So I get the interview, um, I interview with the team. Um, I thought we had really good energy. Uh, mind you, I was coming from LA. Uh, I took Megabus like 10 hours from LA to San Francisco to go to this interview. And then I took my mom's beat up 2001 Camry with no headlights, the radio didn't work, the windows didn't work. And I'm driving to Silicon Valley across the street from Google and my mom's beat up car where I see all these Teslas. So I'm driving in and I'm like, where's their parking stall where I can find my mom's car? Cause this is a little bit embarrassing, but I know it's gonna be great. Um, but I go in, I have the interview. And when I have the interview, they say, okay, we'll get back to you. So I go back to um, school and I get this message from my manager and he tells me that the team decided not to go with me and that I should go with the tech firm or with the um with the with the law firm because that would be more for me they said that I would get bored in the role and I should do something of something along the lines of that or it's more fast paced uh, I cried my heart out. My sister Natasha is on the phone and she'll tell you that I absolutely cried. I was devastated. I didn't understand like, why would you do that? This is my absolute dream job. But after I got sad, I got mad. And after I got mad, I got motivated. I expressed like, you can't tell me no. I'm not really good at people telling me no. So what did I do? I wrote a rebuttal letter. Um, my first draft was a little nasty. I do admit that, but I had people to help me out and edit it and tell them why I deserve to be on the team. I told them that you don't have the right to tell me that I'd be bored in a role when you haven't even gave me a chance. I know for a fact that I can add value to the team, given that everything that I can bring to the team. Um, if you think otherwise, then you can do that after you let me on the team, but I will prove to you if you give me another chance how valuable and educated that I really am. So instead of meeting with the team again, I had a meeting with the CSEL, and this was another interesting thing because they called me down in the middle of finals week. So again, I had to take the mega bus down 12 hours in the middle of the week and have this interview with the CISO, but she was a woman. So it was great. It was great inspiration. And then right after that, I had to take the mega bus back to school so I could take my finals. <laughs> um, it's a long trip. Uh, so yeah, as the college and graduation was approaching, the graduation day came, and right before I was about to walk on stage, about 20 minutes before I was about to walk on stage, my now manager offered me the job of the that I have now, um, which was amazing. I had my dream job 20 minutes before I walked on stage, and the good thing is that it wasn't the digital forensics role, but it was data loss prevention lead. And my manager explained to me the reason why he decided to give me this role is because I have, I was smart. Um, when it comes to digital forensics, many of you may or may not know, you have to do things by the book because a lot of things will go to court. He expressed to me that my mind was a lot bigger than this and I needed more autonomy to control my own path and to create things. So with this data loss prevention lead role, I had this absolute opportunity. Um, it was no rules to this. Uh, no one had done it before. And so I was able to take it anywhere that I wanted. So with this, what set me apart from everybody else, I believe is my resilience, my willpower, and the idea that I'm not giving up on something that I know I deserve and I know that I want and I know that I dream for. If I knew, I knew this was right for me and I wasn't going to take no for an answer. And if I did take no for an answer, you were going to tell me exactly why you told me no. Um, so what set me apart was my character and my willpower, my curiosity, and just my heart. I have a lot of heart when it comes to things, especially for the things that I know that I want. Wow, you're a warrior. 
You remind me, uh, there's a, an organization called Empower Her and the founder is Tia Hopkins. She's out of uh, New York, I believe. And she has a phrase that says that confidence is the best competition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got it, it's great. <laughs> Hakeem, what's your story? I was still trying to catch my breath after that. Story. <laughs> I'm still trying to, wow, like, like, I just want to acknowledge that and be like, that's, that's really powerful. Um, so, so I'm going to feed off the confidence that Babette had and the, the, the tenacity to hustle, right? So it's always going to be a bit of a hustle, right? Because I think on paper, I'm better in person than I am in, on paper. So um, my first real tech job was at Credit Suisse. I got an internship during my first and second year of my business program. And I had a good friend who was an ally who said, you know what, if you want to get, I was in Pittsburgh and he was like, if you want to get a job in New York City, people like to see you in New York City. They're not just going to read your resume and give you an interview. And I was like, okay. So he's like, just, and I got a connection through a friend. So again, through those it was a friend who knew another friend whose ex-boyfriend worked at the bank and I sent them my resume and then it sat on somebody's desk. And my good friend at school was like, Hakeem, call the guy and tell him you're gonna be in New York tomorrow. And do you have 10 minutes for coffee? And I was like, but I'm not gonna be in New York tomorrow. He's like, just call him and say it. <laughs> so I was like, all right, but this is part of the hustle and learning how to hustle and giving yourself those, that personal board of directors who are gonna push you. So I did it and he was and he was like, okay, like, you know, what time are you gonna be here? Come meet me, we'll do, you know, lunch at 12. So I spent, I probably charged my credit card, got a ticket the next day, uh, went there um, and it was just a conversation. And as I said, I'm much better in person than I am on paper. So, you know, I was able to communicate to him, tell him what I did at AOL, tell him how I learned Rain Man, tell him uh, all the projects we had worked on, and, and he understood it and he was like, okay, I'm gonna give you the summer you know, analyst position in this technology team. And, um, and, and that's how I got it. So, um, but, uh, and what set me apart from other applicants? Uh, I, I think it was just, you know, somebody says, if you don't have a seat at the table, pull up a folding chair and sit down, right? <laughs> you gotta put your foot in the door smile, be polite, professional, punctual, but really argue your case and argue your case with that confidence and let them know that even if you don't know how to get it done, you'll figure out how to get it done tomorrow, right? You're that type of person. So that's my story. Great, great. I love it. Well, you got, both of you um, actually addressed some of what I wanted to hear based on the second question. In other words, how did you make that transition from education into your cybersecurity role? And you know, what was it from getting in that you continue to leverage? And that's, you know, it sounds like you both have confidence, you know how to work it, but you also know that you have to be 150, 200%. Is there anything you would like, like to add that now that you got in and your experience while you were in college, what do you continue to leverage in your role now that you've been doing it for several years? Um, I know for me, it's speak up. Uh, luckily, I have a lot of people on my team and we have synergy. They know that I'm kind of quiet. Well, I was kind of quiet in the beginning, but they gave me the opportunity to like, they would pick on me literally and say, hey, Babette, do you have anything to contribute? And I always have my mind going because I think a lot. Um, but now I say what's on my mind um, and I fight for what I want. And for me, I understand the idea of respect, but I also understand the idea that if I want something or if I need something or if something needs to be done, who is, do I directly need to talk to? If you can't help me, then someone else is gonna help me and I need to be in direct contact with that person. I particularly don't care about the politics behind how everything is going and I will send a direct email to that person, um, but, I came in and I didn't really know that was rude. <laughs> um, not rude, but you have to go through like leverages and everything, but I personally don't care. Um, if I want something done, then I'm going to find the correct person to do it or the correct people to help me. And understanding the idea of having those connections, having those networks inside of the job, having people inside of your team, outside of your team in different business units is going to help you a long way because 
people will remember you for who you are and what you do and how you make them feel. So just going out there and speaking to people and talking to people and telling you their story and just expressing yourself. That's very important. Don't hide in the don't hide in the corner because I know I did that for the first year, but I decided no, I'm not. I'm here to make noise and empower change and drive everything. So that's what I want to add. Network with people everywhere that you go. You never know what someone can do for you or what you can do for them. Um, and one of my favorite things is to just listen. Listen to people like they always have something important to say because they possibly will. That is that is important. Listening to people like they that's respect. And I gotta say, it's, I gotta gotta add this. Networking is through how I met. Babette and Hakeem at networking events at the ISSA chapter, San Francisco <laughs> chapter. Hakeem. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm a, you, you always, I'm, I've always had a passion for learning, right? Or figuring out a Rubik's cube. I'm just, I just <laughs> love learning, right? And I love learning complicated things. So, um, you know, I'm a sucker for education. I do have two master's degrees. Um, I, you know, I do cybersecurity certifications. I attend every sort of free, yeah, you know, I, I attend all the ISSA events. I listen to things about that I don't understand um, because I know one day I will understand them even though I'm not there yet, right? So it's almost like I've been able to, you know, tune out all the noise of media and nonsense and what's going on in the world. Right? I listen to, you know, politics. We need, love to have the, the young ones here, but we need to mute them. They're not ready for cyber yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, so like I listen to um, uh, podcasts, Darknet Diaries. I, I, when I run and I go to the gym, um, I'll take every free cybersecurity training course. You don't necessarily have to take the exam, but I'll just read through the material. Um, sometimes I, I actually attend Sam Boone's classes sometimes because they're free. I read his website very often. Um, uh, I just immerse myself in, in, in what I'm in because I'm, I'm curious about it. Um, and I think that, that that is sort of my secret sauce, right? So when I come to the table, I'm having a conversation, I have a broad perspective, I can talk relatively intelligently. Um, but then again, I think I'm gonna go back to that tenacity and just being, and the hustle, right? Everything is a real hustle, right? And I think when I was younger, I was probably shy, I was probably that person in the corner and I was afraid to speak out. But then I realized, I was like, I actually do have a voice and my opinion counts. And in fact, I come with a different perspective because I've always had to hustle and I've always seen the shortest path to success. I'm, I'm thinking outside of general constructs. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I've usually achieved most of my goals. So now I'm quite confident that if I say this is how we need to approach a situation, it's going to be the most effective way to get it done. But that self-confidence came up over the years and was developed. But I think I'll go back to what Babette said, like everyone in the world has their own secret sauce and everyone is intelligent. So feel free to speak out and, and, and the experience of having other people challenge your ideas and debating those ideas and arguing your approach is just gonna strengthen your critical thinking ability. And that's a lot of what we have to do in life is critical thinking. Here's this approach, here's this constraint. What is the optimal way to achieve this goal, right? Given the constraints, the environments, the change, given COVID, given working from home, given fam, like there's always constraints, but you always have to achieve that goal. So once you have that critical thinking ability, I think that's key to being successful in the, in the, in the field of cybersecurity. Totally agree. I think one of the things I always try to remind my, my mentees is that we are all here uh, to do something that hasn't been done by anybody else. We're all unique and have something to bring. No matter what you think, it's the truth. <laughs> um, all right, one of the, now that the, the, the two of you are, are, have been in your roles for a while, um, you know, actually both of you are leaders. Um, one of the things I remember as I was uh, uh, moving into 
you know, leadership role because you have a lot more uh, visibility is I found that I had to code switch, you know, because I came from a different environment. I, you know, I grew up in Compton and then I had to go into Century City to work. Um, and so it was always, always a feeling that I had to go back and forth between who I truly felt I was and to, as opposed to what I thought people were expecting of me. That's what I mean by code switching. You have to go back and forth between cultures. Um, you know, did you, have you experienced that? And, and uh, you know, how did it, how did it impact how you were showing up? Because you know, based on what you shared, the two of you are very strong in character. It's what got you to where it is. But then sometimes you have this authenticity. It's like, well, who's showing up? Is it me or is it who people expect me to be? Do you have that kind of experience of it at all? And, and how, how did you deal with it? That it? Um, for me, in the beginning, I did have it. I came into my company with a blonde afro, cut off all my hair. <laughs> um, I had glasses. Uh, when it came to my team, uh, we came from all different walks of life, but it was kind of hard for me to like relate to them on many levels, giving the like background that I had and where I came from um, and where I grew up. Uh, and even when talking to people, my company is like, like majority Indian and Asian. Um, so it wasn't like any black people at all. Um, like I was like the only black person in my entire building uh, and then crunching the numbers for my company, I think it was last year, we were only like 2% Black people out of the whole entire company of over 10,000 people. Um, so I always had like trouble trying to connect with people. Um, but I was able to just find my voice and find myself. The more people that I began to talk to, the more like things that I started getting myself involved in. I started getting myself involved as a culture ambassador, uh, inclusion and diversity ambassador, just being everywhere that I can be. Uh, I started opening up, but with that, I also understood you have to know how to talk to people. You have to understand their language. You can't talk to people talk to everyone the same. Um, in the same way where I told you that my company was able to connect the business and technology side, business people wanna hear numbers. Technical people wanna hear the technical stuff. You have to be able to do both roles. You have to be able to find people's motives, find what they're interested in and be able to talk to them to get the actual point of cross. And I thank my manager for that. Um, he's sadly leaving the company on Monday, but I thank him for that, for being able to like really hammer that into me that I can be myself, but I have to be able to talk to people in a way that they'll be able to listen and to understand. And right now, that's my version of cold switching, now that I'm able to pretty much fully be myself. Um, and the same thing with like the hair stuff, I was kind of afraid to do like the whole braids and change my hair a lot um, because I felt like I had Afro. I didn't really want people to look at me and coming into work um, with my hair changed and everything. Uh, but now I don't really care. Every month I have a new co color and I embrace it. So I embrace being myself. Um, and yeah. Be yourself. Be true to yourself. Hakeem, what about you? So early in my career, because I was working, I, I've had I worked at conservative companies, financial institutions, um, where I definitely had to play that game um, and be somebody I really wasn't. Uh, I'm a gay black man, um, and I really had to code switch and take the black and the gay out of it and just be this professional sort of zombie. Right when I was at those those jobs. Now I also had to pay the rent, pay the bills, pay my college loan. So it was something I had to do. And in my mind, it was like, well, this is work, and then you have your social life on the side. Like they're not supposed to be intermingled, right? Until I came to a fantastic company where I am today that really embraces diversity and really embraces bringing your whole self to work. 
Now, let me tell you what it made me, re- well, for, and you have to work for a, a manager or a leader who also um, embraces those values, right? So once I, I came here, half that stress of putting up this, this code switching and, and watching your P's and Q's just goes out the window. And you're actually twice as effective mm-hmm. because you're yourself. You don't have to put up your guards. You don't have to censor yourself. You don't have to censor your emotions. All this nonsense because you were worried about whether people thought or it just goes out the window because at the end of the day, it's what you're delivering and what you're bringing to the table. And your individuality is your strength, mm-hmm. right? The diversity is a strength, your unique view on a situation is your strength. So um, now, you know, if we take it back years, I, if, if I had to get the job and pay the bills, that's what I had to do, right? So, and then again, sort of echoing what Babette said, you know, depending on different levels, you have to play certain games, right? If you're talking to the board of directors, like you have to talk to the board of directors, right? If you're talking to people who are baby boomer generation, like you have to speak in their language. If you're talking to people of a younger generation, it's best you speak in a vernacular that they understand. So it's an important skill set to have to know how to code switch, right? But it's also very important to be true to who you are and true to yourself. I think it actually, I I was thinking the same thing, listening to both of your stories, that it actually becomes a skill that you can apply. In other words, to be able to talk to both business and tech, business business managers and engineers, and then also to adapt to new job environments and new roles. But at the same time, it does probably lead to some introspection about who you are and what what you bring. Which, you know, yeah, go ahead. I, I would also say, find find a place where you can be you right in this day and age you don't need all that stress you don't need people not accepting you for who you are or how you talk or your accent you just find a place where people will and there's there's tons of companies out there so you know maybe startups are are a little more free than than long established companies right just find that place where you can be yourself because you're going to be the best version of yourself there a lot of times you can know right away whether you're coming into that kind of company or not. <laughs> so, all right, well, this is the last question and we're gonna go over a little because we got a late start, 15, minute late, 15 minutes late and starting because of our, our link snafu. But um, for the last question, I'd like to know, you know, all of this wonderful experience and learning and, and the, the testing of, of your character, um, how how have you can leverage that? We we've, we've heard how you're thriving with it, but now what are you doing to be a model for others? Um, for myself, I do pride myself in, like I said, giving back because I do not want any person to feel how I felt in college. So I know I have people in my network who come to me and tell me that they have students who are in cybersecurity, who are interested in cybersecurity, and I, I, I give them uh, I give them pretty much every resource that I have. A fun fact about me is that I collect information and data and store it because I believe I'm going to need it somehow. Um, but yeah, I've collected everything from all the Facebook groups that I'm a part of, all the Instagram profiles that I follow, my uh, tips, tricks, and tools for building a network on LinkedIn, uh, reaching out to people to get jobs, like everything that I did to get to where I am, I have it like jam packed in a really long email that I send to students that want help. And then on top of that, I do have a page called technically two underscore rows uh, on Instagram where I give my tips, tricks and tools about cybersecurity. Um, Cybersecurity is something that is becoming more and more talked about and I love it because it's very important. But I did see when I got my intern um, that people had a hard time explaining cybersecurity in very simple terms. Um, when I watched the videos, it they were like boring and mundane. So I took it upon myself to 
liven it up a little and make videos that people can understand about the cybersecurity tips, tricks, tools, and news that are going out there. So that's something that I'm taking uh, initiative and priding myself in, uh, in the hopes that someone will see it, they'll see me and see that I'm an African American, I'm an African American female, or if I'm just like a young millennial talking about cybersecurity, that it'll bring more talk about the topic, bring more interest about the topic, and just protect people overall. Well, before the, the this this tech talk ends, that bet, would you please put that Instagram ID in the chat? I know that people are going to really want to see that. I've checked it out. It is so cool. <laughs> Hakeem, what about you? So, yeah, you know, I think that just because, uh, you know, I can remember my first job in college was probably like doing dishes at Ponderosa or Burger King to where I am now. And that that whole struggle is be nice to everybody and treat everyone as if they were the CEO. It doesn't matter what level they're at. And remember that everything is relationship driven, right? Never get down to business. Always acknowledge the person, call them by their name three times, ask them, about, get to know them, their family, where they live, like establish a basis of a human relationship. You're dealing with humanity here then start talking about the ones and the zeros and the cybers and the attacks and the and the ransomware and the CVEs and and then close it again by getting back to that humanity you're dealing with a person doesn't matter what level they're at have a good day have a great weekend what are you doing because you know how you make them feel is going to last for a lifetime they're going to remember okay olivia said hi to me she asked me a question she called my name she knows who i am she's a good i and i, I, I want to talk to her again because we're gonna we're gonna kiki or we're gonna joke or we're gonna we're gonna touch base as people before we get down to business and and really when you do that to all levels of the organization um you you make a lot of allies you make a lot of allies relationships so important and if you think back i mean that that really is what is what what it's all about it's it's even even in 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 your say you're on a project team the relationships on the team versus your relationship with your manager it's all about relationships and i'll just add to that like i i, I volunteer with a lot of nonprofits. i will mentor and talk to anybody who hits me up on linkedin um and i'll get my contact information to you um, and you can send it to everybody who's here. So, um, but I, I also think it's important to 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 celebrate your success and to try and mentor um, and be a role model for those who are coming up behind you. So, um, and and in doing that, I think that that makes me feel even better about what I do and where I am, you know, than the paycheck or you know the bells and the whistle. Because success to me is not what you have; it's what you can do for other people. Well, as you were saying earlier, we're standing on the shoulders of people that went before us. Mm -hmm. And we want to be the shoulders for the people that are coming up behind us. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think that's what this is all about. Um, so you, you, you both epitomize that. Thank you so much. And again, I think we're going to go over a little because we got a late start. So to give, to give folk a chance to um, ask questions. And so I'm going to stop sharing and go into gallery view here. And um, Sarah, do you want, have you taken a look at the questions and uh, want to uh, go through them for us? You know, I have been um, monitoring the chat and um, everything is, uh, there are the most delightful comments about how awesome Babette and Akeem are and, and there are no questions, it, it's just this, lovely if if either of you haven't had a chance yet to check it out you should definitely scroll through it because it's um it's great no, oh, yeah. no questions so far All but right. actually so, the only piece was um babette i think um if you could pop your um that instagram account that you were talking about if you could pop that in the chat that would be great um, got it i'll pop it in there Thank um you. i do see a question Oh, here one just came in yeah oh now they're coming in they're coming in 
Okay, so um, Gia says, um, did you experience imposter syndrome? And if so, what did you do to overcome it? Um, well, for myself, yes, I experienced imposter sy syndrome in college. Uh, like I said, the story that I told, I felt like I had to try 10 times harder. And even when I got there, I felt like I didn't deserve to be there. Uh, I felt like, um, because I know I can talk my way through to a lot of things, I kind of felt like I cheated my experience. Uh, and even now, I feel, I feel imposter syndrome. Um, due to the fact that my company hires really, 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 really smart people. Um, like a lot of the people, even like from my team, or I was overhearing an interview and this person had like a long list of like working for NASA and the military and doing the, all these different things. And I was like, little old me, I'm here, I made it. Um, so I still have imposter syndrome, but the way that I overcome it is understanding that I deserve this and I worked really hard to get to where I am and despite everything that was put against me coming out my mom's womb being black being an African-American in America in California in San Francisco growing up in Sunnydale the ghetto I overcame all that and I got to the place of where I'm becoming the quote-unquote American dream so I can care less what anyone else has to say I deserve this and I made it and I'm not going to compare myself to anyone because no one has the same journey as me and that's it don't compare yourself to anyone compare yourself to the person you were yesterday that's it that is absolutely it <laughs> yes yes to every bit of that oh goodness <laughs> I get an um, amen and a hallelujah <laughs> I go to Sunnyvale. I'm in Viz Valley, girl. What's up with neighbors? So, <laughs> um, so. Hakeem, there's a question for you from Riley. Um, she wants to know if you're open to mentoring students in other areas other than cybersecurity. Of course, any, any, anything. And, and paying it forward because I had so many people keep me straight, tell me how to dress, get me jacked up before my interviews, get me over. You know, sometimes you have that evil roommate and that roommate's like, no, maybe not. And, you know, it was my friends and my homie. I have one of them here, Tommy Zesma, Tommy Z, who were like, yes, you can, Hakeem, go get it. Like, like just go for it, you know? And that's all you need sometimes just to get across the line. Right? That's all you need. Yeah. Hi, Tommy. <laughs> and then Elizabeth wants you to know, Hakeem, that um, her favorite phone of all time was Palm Pre. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that is all the questions that I've seen popping up on, on chat. Right. And so we have, yeah, so we have Hakeem's uh, contact information. Uh, Babette, did you put your Instagram? Um, yes, I did. Great. Okay. All right. Here's, a, here's another one. What do you suggest for networking and finding a mentor? Um, well, for me, I did it uh, like, a, I wouldn't say old fashioned way, but I went to LinkedIn in the position that I wanted, which was a digital forensics analyst or information security analyst. I typed it into LinkedIn and every person that I found who had that role, I sent them a note before I messaged them and told them, hey, my name is Babette Jackson. I'm trying to become a digital forensics analyst or information security analyst. I want to grow my network. Um, thank you for adding me. So I did that every single day until LinkedIn told me that I no longer could do it because I maxed out on the limit. Um, and that's how I started networking. And then on top of that, I did the same thing for Facebook. All I did was type in tech, uh, technology, cybersecurity, black and tech. And I found so many different Facebook groups that had so many different people who wanted to help and who were in my same role, same position. And I just continued to introduce myself and go to these different groups. And then I did the same thing on Instagram. I followed the hashtags of technology, of black and tech, of STEM. And whenever I've seen a person who had that in their bio or STEM or cybersecurity, I immediately added them and introduced myself. So I just threw myself out there. What about you, Hakeem? 
I would add to that, you have to do some shameless self-promotion and <laughs> leverage the tools at hand. But somebody also said, become a part of the conversation, right? So I didn't quite get this, but it's a very powerful tool. Like on your LinkedIn, on your Twitters, on your Facebook, repost an article about what it is you're getting into. Like this, you just you get a news feed repost, you know, there's this new vulnerability or this new software came out, or this is the latest um, language or, you know, solar winds, law, what, whatever it is, just be a part of that conversation. Then what I really did was I went to an ISSA meeting and I looked at everyone who was in the room and Olivia, you were one of them. And I found them on LinkedIn and I was like, okay. And I, I just hit them up. You should put a little message like, hi, so I at the meeting, blah, blah, blah. And then I would say, I'd reach out to 10 of them and say, hey, can I talk to you for 15 minutes or can I have an informational interview? Or maybe I'll see you next month and I'll come early and we can have a little side conversation. And I started making these little connections, right? But you take a take to the next step, I started volunteering, right? So I was like, okay, this is a community of people I wanna be in. I need to take a leadership role so that I can at least like be a part, have that seat at the table to be like, what is our next event? Are we gonna do this thing? This is what's happening. You know, when there's a big conference, at least you have some people to walk around with. So like when it's all confusing and people, you know, you hear a new term, I can be alone and say, hey, Jimmy, what does this mean? Or what do you think I should go and talk to, right? So be an active part of the community by reposting articles that takes you two seconds a day, like it's nothing, um, and be a shameless self-promoter on LinkedIn and on Twitter, right? Um, and be fun about it, right? Don't just be dry, add some humor, put your personality in it because, you know, work can be dry and, and boring sometimes. <laughs> so put some flavor into it, right? And, 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 and you'll attract people who, who gravitate towards your uniqueness, right? And that's gonna be your family, that's gonna be your tribe, that's gonna be your board of directors. Those are the people who will stay with you throughout your whole professional career and open doors that you didn't even know existed. Let's see, Michelle has a question. Uh, I think it's for, for you, Babette. Did, did the people in LinkedIn reply to you after you messaged them with the connection request? Um, some of them did, but I did like add over a thousand people. <laughs> so <laughs> not all of them replied, not all of them accepted my friend request. Again, it's cybersecurity and one of the like rules is don't accept random friend requests from people that you don't know. <laughs> um, but I did gain a lot of people in my network and by gaining a lot of people in my network, I was able to learn more about cybersecurity because those were the people who what Hakeem mentioned were pulsing about what's happening in cybersecurity security, um, which is one more thing that I want to add is be drained in cybersecurity. Everybody has an Instagram or a Twitter now, like go instead of like, well, not instead of adding on to the people that you already follow, follow people that are inside cybersecurity who are like recreating articles who are posting stuff. So that way everybody goes on Instagram when they take a break. But when you're on Instagram, you're actually still engaged and still learning and still growing while you're scrolling on all your different social medias. You have to learn how to utilize what you have in your time to make it work for you. And this is one of the hacks that I did for myself. Excellent. What I, I all of these comments are just so so positive. I, I love it. It looks like this was really, you know, more very inspirational. It probably answered a lot of questions. So, Hakeem, that that thank you so much for uh, being with us this evening. This is just an incredible experience, and I'm so glad we recorded it because I know we probably because of that link problem, missed, missed, missed a few people. But now uh, we're at the hour, 7.15. We got started at 6.15. So I want to thank you all for joining. Uh, I just want to give one plug for our next um, Tech Talk. Uh, March is Women's 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 is it women's history month or women's women's month? Anyway, we have an incredible, again, very diverse panel. And the uh theme is that a lot of what we were hearing from Babette about 
hey, I want to give back. I want to be in service. A lot of times the reason that women get into tech is they want to have a social, some type of a social impact. And that's what the theme of uh, our next talk will be. So thank you all for coming and I uh, hope to see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.